Hello, I'm Michael Pierce, and this is The Human Condition. Today we're talking about the many effects of the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia are structures in a person's brain that are not often discussed because they're not visualized in QEG or EEG brain scans, and um, they don't reveal themselves in you know, what I think a lot of people consider the sexy brain. The, the, the sexy brain is the brain part that's very exciting, which is the surface of the brain, the lobes of the brain, the frontal lobes, the parietal lobes, the temporal and occipital lobes. And those are the areas of the brain that are really considered the human parts of the brain that involve, you know, uh, understanding English and language and understanding um, mathematics and understanding the scheme and effect of a plot or a, a political ramification of a decision. A deeper meaning. Emotions, these are all different things that are, are present in our cortex and studied quite a lot by psychologists, but the uh, basal ganglia is a little bit deeper. The basal ganglia is a set of nuclei or, or regions, uh, clusters of gray matter that make decisions. And so they are processing centers that process a decision. They process information partly, and then they pass on that decision to the next and the next and the next until it comes out of this loop. So you can think of the basal ganglia, first of all, as relay stations that, that modify a signal, make decisions about that signal to either amp it up and, and make it more excitatory, or to turn it down and make it more inhibitory. So think of the basal ganglia as these multiple centers in your brain that are fairly deep. So we're going down, you know, an inch or two into the brain, into these deeper zones, and imagine them as islands floating in, in your brain. The second thing you need to know about the basal ganglia is that it's, it's bilateral. There's a completely almost independent basal ganglia on the left side versus the right side of the brain in each hemisphere. And these, these nuclei have names, and so I'm just going to name them for you, but let this wash over you, it's not very important. They have names like the caudate, the putamen, the globus pallidus internus, the globus pallidus externus, the subthalamic nucleus of Louise, and clostrum. These are different areas of the basal ganglia, and they are part of a circuit that receives information from the cerebellum, it receives information from the lobes of the brain, from the cortex, receives information from the thalamus, and sends it back out to those structures. So you can think of it as kind of like, you know, in a soccer game, when everyone's playing European football or, or American soccer, sometimes the, um, the players will drop back near their, their goal that they're defending, and they will return the ball to the fullbacks and the goalie in order to gain control of the ball and then throw it back out into the field. The idea of the basal ganglia is the cortex does a lot of hard work learning new things. And once the cortex has learned how to do a new task, it tends to try to encapsulate that task into simple instructions and dump it to the basal ganglia for automaticity. It likes to be able to say, for example, like when you brush your teeth, it likes to say, okay, I want, I want to go on automatic pilot for this task and I don't want to have to deal with it. So I want the basal ganglia to take over this conscious but complex task. So it isn't fully conscious, but it's also not unconscious. Now you might wonder, well, doesn't the cerebellum do that? Well, yeah, at the bottom of your head, the cerebellum also does that kind of thing. It controls and coordinates automatic movement, but the basal ganglia more controls repetitive movement. It controls repeated movement, whereas the cerebellum controls and coordinates speed, timing, and refines movement from our conscious mind. It refines it and adds a layer of, of precision to it, but it's still quite variable, whereas the basal ganglia simply deals with repetitive movements that are done over and over and over again, like brushing your teeth. And so that concept of brushing your teeth is a really good way of explaining what the basal ganglia does. So the third thing you need to know about the basal ganglia is that there is a direct and an indirect pathway. Now, I like to think about the basal ganglia direct and indirect pathway as a gas pedal, which is the direct or excitatory stimulatory pathway. And the indirect pathway is the inhibitory pathway, which is like the brake pedal. So you can kind of think of this as a crazy car that has on both the driver's side and, and the other side, it has a gas pedal and a brake pedal. And you kind of need to decide who's driving. And um, if one hemisphere is dominant and that hemisphere is active, then the other hemisphere tends to be a little less active. Not always, but it tends to do that. And, and likewise, it goes the other way. So we see a lot of people with, say, um, repetitive obsessional thoughts having more active left limbic systems that are over-firing in their language centers where they hear their own voice or they hear another person talking inside their head, telling them something over and over again. They have repeated messages that they can't get out of their head. It might be a short phrase, 
Something is going on, and essentially in that case, their left basal ganglia, direct pathway, is overfiring. And so as it overfires, it begins to just keep firing and exciting the cortex and exciting the brain and getting the brain more going going, and the person can't turn it off. Meanwhile, the right hemisphere is probably suppressed. It's not doing as much. It's certainly working. It's not dead, but it's not doing as much. So this, this battle for control should be a very dynamic control. It should be a, an interplay where one hemisphere takes dominance, then the other one takes dominance. It isn't very much dominance. There isn't the drastic dominance difference between the two. And, um, and it's, easily, it's easily switched. But um, there are times where the person can't turn off either the direct pathway in one hemisphere or the indirect pathway in, in a hemisphere. Often you'll see movement disorders where a resting tremor will occur opposite the basal ganglia in the body. So if I have a left-handed resting tremor, it usually comes from the right basal ganglia misfiring. Likewise, if I have a problem with my right side that is, is, is tremoring at rest without any movement or any action, just sitting there tremoring by itself, usually my left basal ganglia is responsible for that. Whereas there are intention tremors where if I actually do something like I point to an object and I shake, my right hand might be shaking, and that's usually due to a right, same side, cerebellum dysfunction. And those are, they tend to be easier to treat, not necessarily, but they're easier to treat and they're, and they're easier on a patient if you have an intention tremor, but not a resting tremor. So these are the hallmarks, but not always the case. These are the hallmarks of tendencies of the basal ganglia. Basal ganglia is resting, it's the opposite side. Cerebellum is intention. It happens when you do something, and, and the, the closer you get to the target, the worse it gets. And that is uh, the cerebellum on the same side, typically. So once we have this uh, understanding that there's a basal ganglia problem, we need to, to know that the basal ganglia is susceptible to a, a number of toxins and, and heavy metals. So while the cerebellum is more sensitive to alcohol, the basal ganglia is, is quite sensitive to heavy metal deposition. The, uh, these are pathways often called lenticulostriate pathways or other, other types of names. There's, in neurology, there's like four names for everything. So try not to be intimidated because everything's got four names or five names. But heavy metal deposition in the basal ganglia will cause dysfunction. That, that tissue is more sensitive to such deposition. And it's also more sensitive to a number of man-made synthetic chemicals. And those synthetic chemicals are, um, are dangerous to the to basal ganglia and can cause the direct pathway to wind up, which makes us have excessive activity and excessive re repetitive thoughts, and, uh, or, or the uh, indirect pathway to give us inhibitory movement. So we have inhibited movement and we don't move very much. So direct pathway on either side, indirect pathway on either side. Direct pathway makes more stiffness and more gain and more tension and more action and, and, and more spastic tone and more tremor and more uh, repetitive thoughts. And the indirect pathway creates less likelihood to drive motor function. Now, here's the problem. Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is a, is a lesion of essentially the direct pathway that gets damaged by, by something else, which is the substantia nigra in the mesencephalon. So the substantia nigra in the mesencephalon is lesioned, and it doesn't produce what it's supposed to do. And so you end up with a dopamine problem where the direct pathway doesn't work. And when the direct pathway doesn't work, the indirect pathway is able to shine forth and, and uninhibited. So when that happens, you get a, a tendency toward lack of motoricity, lack of stimulation, and you get lots of inhibition of the brain. So the cortex doesn't want to fire. Everything slows down. Motion slows down. The face stops working. The lips stop working. Drool happens. The person can't keep their mouth closed. They have a, a mask face. They can't have any facial expression. Their eyes tend not to move around much. They just have this blank expression. Their cortex doesn't want to fire very much, so they start having hallucinations and thoughts of things that are not real because their brain isn't, isn't getting enough activation. They get problems with, um, with movement where their, their movement is slowed and their, and their steps are slowed and their balance is, is affected. And all of their movement slows. Now you might ask, well, gosh, why do they get a tremor, which is fast movement or excessive movement, when they have dominance of the indirect pathway and a lesion of the direct pathway? Well, that's kind of complicated and we're not gonna explain all of it here, but the general idea is there's a general set of rotating stimuli in a, in a nervous system that rotates a bunch of different motor units so that when you're, all of your muscles don't fire at the same time, our, our brains are automatically rolling through like a rolling blackout. 
And this rolling blackout is where we, we inhibit alternately and turn on alternately different nerves to different muscles, so different parts of each muscle, so that each muscle is primed and, and firing and, and having a bit of a ripple. And that's called the physiologic tremor. And usually the physiologic tremor is timed such that we never see an actual tremor, but there are opposing firings of muscles that are flexors and extensors that are in opposition to each other so that the net effect is no movement. What that allows us to do is have instant fast movement when it's time for us to react and move instead of overcoming the starting friction of a completely still muscle. If a muscle were completely still and inactive and we had to bring it to threshold, it would take a lot longer to make that muscle fire and be able to grab something or defend something or pull back. And so that speed comes about from us having these rolling blackouts of different nerve muscle combinations, which are called motor units, where some are going through this rolling blackout. They're turned off, they're turned on, and they're turned off and turned on alternately to each other. So the net sum of them is no, no tremor. When we have a lesion of the direct pathway, the indirect pathway is allowed to, to shine forth and, and be prominent, you start to see that physiologic tremor revealed and you end up with a revealing of, of a, you know, about an eight cycle per second tremor, which is the slow Parkinsonian tremor. This is not the familial tremor um, that, that a lot of people have or the, or the typical tremor of coffee or adrenal dysfunction, which is very fast, low amplitude, high frequency, very fast but small tremor. Parkinsonian type movement disorders are much more large amplitude, slow frequency, and very different, and they much more resemble the foundational frequencies of our own rolling blackout, which is our own physiologic tremor uh, frequencies. So that's part of why a person actually has these excessive movements and tremors when they have inhibited movement in Parkinson's disease. So that gets a little bit complicated for people that are trying to understand how does this neurology work. There are exercises that can be done to help the basal ganglia improve as long as the chemistry is being supported. There are many, many discussions about chemistry. We're not going to talk about those in this session today, but there are brain exercises that are designed to aim at one hemisphere's direct pathway or one hemisphere's indirect pathway to help them wind up or wind down in a healthy way of plasticity. Wind up is technically referring to, in textbooks, wind up is a pathological thing where a, an area of brain is overfiring excessively and that's not good. It's not quite seizure level, but it's, it's heading toward um, the threshold of, of you know, spontaneous seizure activity. Now, if we don't have enough activity in cells, we can't get long-term potentiation. We can't, get, we can't teach an old dog new tricks. So we want to be able to have enough activation of regions of the brain to be able to learn new tricks, which is to say, to remember something that we learned and, and use it, which is kind of what we call long-term potentiation. If you can keep a, a group of neurons firing for three months or longer, we tend to call that long-term potentiation, and it varies in, in, the, in the literature. But generally, if we can keep an area firing at a higher rate than it was after it learned something new for around three months, you tend to keep that forever as a human. So we want to be able to wind up parts of the brain in a healthy way, but not in an unhealthy way. So there are brain exercises that can, can be done for the frontal lobes, for the midbrain, for the cerebellum that, that activate those areas that feed into the direct pathway and make them, make them activate, and little more complex ones that feed into the indirect pathway and make them calm down or inhibit and make them, make them relax. And those have to do with uh, essentially inhibitory pathways from the cerebellar cortex and other types of inhibitory, more advanced inhibitory uh, exercises that a, a, a rehab doctor or physical therapist would give a patient who is trying to, you know, affect the indirect pathway. As always, removing toxins are extremely important in this, this scenario, and those toxins can be heavy metals, and those toxins could also be synthetics. Those toxins could be bacteria, viruses, foodborne pathogens, and uh, dust and allergens, and they could be auto-intoxication from the body's uh, inability to detoxify itself through its phase one and phase two liver pathways and phase three intestinal clearance pathways. So that's just a simple review of the basal ganglia. We see this problem in people that have tardive dyskinesia, which is uh, often caused by drug effects, um, a movement disorder of the tongue and dancing movements of the body. We see the basal ganglia in nearly all of the, all of the spontaneous movement disorders. Basal ganglia is responsible, this is called the extrapyramidal system. It's responsible for all of these movements at rest that are spontaneous. Some of them are writhing movements of the core of the body, like this, some of them are more tremorous movements of the distal portions of the body, like a hand or a foot. Some of them are tongue thrusts. 
Some of them are um, facial movements or, or tics or tremors or, or sudden movements that are repetitive. And, and they are a large class of illnesses, but they are not hopeless. And we need to spend more time looking at these instead of just blanketing them with, with medications and antidepressants and antipsychotics all the time. Although those are useful and a very important tool, they're not the end all, I think. There's so much more for us to do in this world of basal ganglia direct and indirect rehabilitation.